and welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder, and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com. I also post links at pieville.net and at kirksvilletoday.com. Now, today we're going to continue with Chapter 8, which is about the turn of the 20th century in Russia and the build-up to the Communist Revolution. And we did first recording last time of Chapter 8. We're going to do the second one this time. It'll be a little longer, but not too much longer, maybe 14 pages, about page 224 to 238, uh, a couple more sections. And I suppose we'll finish it the next time. So this will be recording number 13. So let's get to it. However, the pale of settlement over the years was becoming more and more permeable. According to the census of 1897, 315,000 Jews were already residing outside its boundaries. That is to say, in 16 years, a ninefold increase, and this represented 9% of the total Jewish population of Russia, apart from the Kingdom of Poland, let us compare. There were 115,000 Jews in France and 200,000 in Brit Great Britain. Let us consider also that the census gave undervalued figures in view of the fact that in many cities of Russia, many craftsmen, many servants serving, quote, authorized, unquote, Jews did not have an official existence, being shielded from registration. So, the actual number of Jews in Russia was not known, and even if there were laws in the book saying they have to live in the pale, he's saying hundreds of thousands, more than even the population of Great Britain or France, lived, already lived outside the pale of settlement. Neither the top of the finance nor the educated elite were su subject to the restrictions of the pale, and both were established freely in the central provinces and in the capitals. It is well known that 14% of the Jewish population practiced quote, liberal professions, unquote, not necessarily the intellectual type. One thing, however, is certain. In pre-revolutionary Russia, the Jews occupied a prominent place in these intellectual occupations. This is a quote. The famous Pale of Settlement itself did not in any way prevent a large fraction of Jews from penetrating more and more into the provinces of central Russia. So again, they keep trying to deal with the Jews by piecemeal restrictions that are semi-enforced or not enforced, usually just flouted or ignored and eventually repealed, and overall we see where it leads them. So you got to keep the big picture in mind. What happened? Well, the Jews produced a revolution and murdered millions and millions and millions of Russians. So whatever they were doing, when you look back, you have to grade it a failure. The so-called artisanal trades where the Jews were the most numerous were the dentists, the tailors, the nurses, the apothecaries, and a few others, trades of great utility everywhere, where they were always welcome. Quote, in 1905 in Russia, more than 1,300,000 Jews were engaged in artisanal activities, which meant they could live outside the pale. They could live anywhere. We've heard that earlier. And it must not be forgotten either that, quote, nowhere in the laws was it stipulated, for example, that the craftsman who exercises a trade has no right to engage in commerce at the same time. Moreover, quote, the notion of doing business is not defined by law. For example, quote, deposit selling with commission. Is it a trade? Is it trade? Thus, in order to exercise any form of trade, even large-scale trading, to engage in the purchase of real estate, in the development of factories, one had to pass an, quote, artisan or, quote, dentist. For example, the artisan Nymark possessed a factory of 60 workers. Typos thus opened their, <clears throat> typographers, I guess is what he's trying to say, thus opened their own printing press. And there existed yet another way. Several people regroup and only one pays the fee of the first guild, the others pretending to be his clerks or even to be adopted in a central province by retired Jewish soldiers. The, quote, adopted father received a pension in return. In Riga, thousands of Jewish families lived on the timber trade until they were expelled due to false attestations. So Jews basically never follow any non-Jew law. They have zero respect for it. 
At the dawn of the 20th century, Jewish settlements were found in all Russian cities of some importance. Jay Title testified that, quote, the construction of the Samara Orenburg railway line resulted in the influx of a large number of Jews to Samara. The supervisors of this railway were Jews, Barchavsky, Gorvich. For a long time, they were also the owners. They occupied the control stations as well as a large number of subordinate jobs. They brought their families from the Pale of Settlement, and thus a very numerous Jewish colony was formed. They also took the export of wheat from the rich province of Samara to foreign countries. It should be noted that they were the first to export eggs from Russia to Western Europe. All these activities were carried out by so-called artisans. And title enumerates three successive governors of the province of Samara. As well as a chief of police who, previously in 1863, had been, quote, excluded from the University of St. Petersburg for having participated in student disorders, who, quote, closed their eyes to these so-called artisans. Thus, around 1889, there lived in Samara, quote, more than 300 Jewish families without a residence permit, which means that in Samara, in addition to the official figures, there were in fact around 2,000 Jews. Stories come to us from the other end of Russia. At Vyazma, quote, the three pharmacists, the six dentists, a number of doctors, notaries, many shopkeepers, almost all hairdressers, tailors, shoemakers, were Jewish. Vyazma, V-I-A-Z-M-A. -A. All those who appeared as such were not dentists or tailors. Many traded, and no one prevented them from doing so. Of its 35,000 inhabitants, Vyazma also had about 2,000 Jews. In the region of the Army of the Don River, where severe restrictions were imposed on Jews in 1880 and where they were forbidden to reside in Cossack villages and suburbs of the cities, there were, nevertheless, 25,000 keepers of inns and buffets, barbers, watchmakers, tailors, and any delivery of a quantity of goods, no matter the size, depended on them. The system of restrictions on the rights of Jews, with a whole range of corrections, reservations, and amendments thereto, had been built up stratum after stratum over the years. The provisions aimed at the Jews were scattered in the various collections of laws promulgated at different times, badly harmonized among themselves, badly amalgamated with the common laws of the empire. The governors complained of it. And we need a clear, consistent rules about the Jews, they're saying. We must try to penetrate the mysteries of the innumerable derogations, special cases, exceptions of exceptions, which swarmed the legislation on the Jews to understand what journey of the combatant this represented for the ordinary Jew, and what puzzle for the administration. Such complexity could only engender formalism with its succession of cruelties. Thus, when a head of a family domiciled in a central Russian province lost his right of residence after his death or as a result of a change of profession, his whole family lost it with him. Families were thus expelled after the death of the head of the family, with the exception of single persons over 70 years of age. However, complexity did not always play in the disfavor of the Jews, it sometimes played to their advantage. Authors write that, quote, it was the police commissioners and their deputies who were responsible for settling the endless wavering in the application of the restrictive measures, which resulted in the use of bribes and to the circumvention of the law always favorable to the Jews. There were also perfectly workable legal channels. Quote, the contradictory nature of the innumerable laws and provisions on the Jews offers the Senate a broad spectrum of interpretations of legislation. In the 90s, most of the provisions appealed by the Jews were annulled by the Senate. The highest dignitaries often closed their eyes to noncompliance with anti-Jewish restrictions. As G. Sleosberg testified, for example, that's one of his main sources, quote, Ultimately, Jewish affairs depended on the head of the police department, Pyotr Nikolaevich Dumovo. The latter was always open to the complainant's arguments, and I must say, to be honest, that if the application of any restrictive regulation were contrary to human charity, Dumovo would look into the matter and resolve it favorably. <laughs> 
quote, rather than the new laws, it was the provisions tending to a harder application of the old laws which were felt most painfully by the broad sections of the Jewish population. The process, discreet but irreversible, by which the Jews gradually penetrated into the provinces of central Russia, was sometimes stopped by the administration, and some duly orchestrated episodes went down in history. This was the case in Moscow after the retirement of the all-powerful and almost irremovable governor, General V.A. Dolgorukov, who had regarded with great kindness the arrival of the Jews in the city and their economic activity. The key to this attitude obviously resides in the person of the great banker Lazar Solomonovich Polyakov, quote, with whom Prince Dolgorukov had friendly ties and who, evil tongues, tongues affirmed, had opened to him in his bank an unlimited line of credit, so the Jews get the nobles with their, with their money. That the prince had need of money, there was no doubt about it, for he had yielded all his fortune to his son-in-law, while he himself, quote, loved to live it up and also had great spendings. Consequently, El Polyakov was covered year after year with honors and distinctions. Thanks to this, the Jews of Moscow felt a firm ground beneath their feet. Quote, Every Jew could receive the right of residence in the capital, unquote, without actually putting himself, quote, at the service of one of his co-religionists, a merchant of the First Guild. On to 227. G. Sliosberg informs us that Dolgorukov was accused of yielding too much to the influence of Polyakov. And he explains, Polyakov was the owner of the Moscow mortgage lending, so neither in the province of Moscow nor in any neighboring province could any other mortgage bank operate, i.e. granting advances on property mortgage funds. Now, quote, there was no nobleman possessing land that did not hypothecate his possessions. Such was the defeat of the Russian nobility at the end of the 19th century, and after that, of what use could it still be for Russia? And he's saying, I guess they were in debt, and they're mortgaging their properties. These noblemen found themselves, quote, in a certain dependence on banks to obtain large loans, all sought the favors of Lazar Polyakov. Under the magistracy of Dolgorukov, around the 90s, quote, there were many recruitments of Jews in the body of merchants of the First Guild. This was explained by the reluctance of Muscovite merchants of Christian de denomination to pay the high entrance fees of this first guild. Before the arrival of the Jews, the Muscovite industry worked only for the eastern part of the country, for Siberia, and its goods did not run westward. It was the Jewish merchants and industrialists who provided the link between Moscow and the markets of the western part of the country. Title confirms that the Jews of Moscow were considered the richest and most influential in Russia. Jews of Moscow were considered the richest and most influential. Threatened by the competition, German merchants became indignant and accused Dolgorukov of favoritism toward the Jews. But the situation changed dramatically in 1891. The new governor general of Moscow, the Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich, an almighty man due to his position and dependent on no one due to his fortune, took the decision to expel all the Jewish craftsmen from Moscow without any preliminary inquiry into who was truly a craftsman and who was just pretending. Whole neighborhoods, Zariadi, Marina Rosha, were emptied of all their inhabitants. It is estimated that as many as 20,000 Jews were expelled by Sergei Alexandrovich the Duke. They were allowed a maximum of six months to liquidate their property and organize their departure, and those who declared that they did not have the means to ensure their displacement were shipped in prison vans. At the height of the expulsions, and to control how they were executed, an American government commission, Colonel Weber, Dr. Kamster, went to Russia. The astonishing thing is that Sleelsberg brought them to Moscow, where they investigated what was happening, how measures were applied to stem the, quote, influx of Jews, where they even visited the Butyrka prison, incognito, where they were offered a few pairs of handcuffs, where they were given the photographs of people who had been sent in the vans, and the Russian police did not notice anything. These were the, quote, Krylov Moors. They visited again for many more weeks other Russian cities. The report of this commission was published in 1892 in the documents of the American Congress, to the greatest shame of Russia, 
and to the liveliest relief of Jewish immigration to the United States. It is because of this harassment that Jewish financial circles, Baron de Rothschild in the lead, refused in 1892 to support Russian borrowing abroad. There had already been attempts in Europe in 1891 to stop the expulsion of Jews from Moscow. The American Jewish banker Seligman, for example, went to the Vatican to ask the Pope to intercede with Alexander III and exhort him to more moderation. In 1891, quote, a part of the expelled Jews settled without permission in the suburbs of Moscow. But in the fall of 1892, following the measures taken, an order was made to expel from Moscow former soldiers of the retired contingent and members of their families not registered in the communities. It should be noted that in 1893, the large Russian commercial and industrial enterprises intervened to soften these measures. Then, from 1899, there was almost no new registration of Jews in the first guild of Moscow merchants. In 1893, a new aggravation of the fate of the Jews arose. The Senate first noticed the existence of a bulletin issued by the Ministry of the Interior in force since 1880, the, quote, Charter of Jewish Freedom, which allowed Jews who had already established themselves outside the Pale of Settlement, illegally, however, to remain where they were. This bulletin was repealed, except in Corland in Livonia, where it was retained. The number of families who had settled over the last 12 years amounted to 70,000 scufflaws. Fortunately, thanks to Dumovo, Life-saving articles were enacted which, in the end, prevented the immense catastrophe that threatened. In 1893, certain categories of Jews were expelled in turn from Yalta, for the summer residence of the imperial family was not far away, and they were forbidden any new settlement there. Quote, the always increasing influx in the number of Jews in the city of Yalta, the appetite for real estate, threatens this holiday resort of becoming, purely and simply, a Jewish city. Here could have been at play, after all the terrorist attacks in Russia, the security of the imperial family and its residence in Lavadia. Alexander III had every reason to believe, he was only one year away from his death, that he was cordially hated by the Jews. It is not possible to exclude his motive the idea of avenging the persecution of the Jews, as can be deduced by the choice of terrorist targets. Sipiagin, Pleva, Grand Duke Serge. This did not prevent many Jews from remaining in the Yalta region, judging from what the inhabitants of Alushta wrote in 1909, complaining that the Jews, buyers of vineyards and orchards, quote, exploit to foster their development, the work of the local population, taking advantage of the precarious situation of said population, and granting loans, quote, at exorbitant rates, which ruin the Tatars, inhabitants of the site. But there was also another thing in the favor of the tireless struggle against smuggling. The right of residence of the Jews in the western frontier zone was limited. There was, in fact, no further expulsion, with the exception of individuals caught in the act of smuggling. According to memorialists, the smuggling, which consisted in passing the frontier to revolutionaries and their printed works, continued until the First World War. In 1903-1904, a debate ensued. The Senate provides that the regional regulations of 1882 shall not apply to the frontier zone, and that accordingly Jews residing in that area may, quote, freely settle in the rural areas. The Council of the Province of Bessarabia then issued a protest, informing the Senate that, quote, the entire Jewish population, unquote, in the border area, including those where Jews had illegally settled there, was now seeking to gain access to the countryside where there were already Quote, more Jews than needed, and quote, that the border area now risked becoming for the Jews the promised area or promised land. The protest passed before the Council of State, which, taking into account the particular case of rural localities, squarely abolished the special regime of the border area, bringing it back to the general regime of the Pale of Settlement. This softening, however, did not find significant echo in the press or in society no more than the lifting in 1887 of the prohibition of the Jews to hire Christian servants. Nor did the 1891 Act, introducing the Penal Code, a new article on, quote, responsibility in the event of an open attack 
on part of the population by another, unquote, an article that the circumstances of life in Russia had never required, but which had been sorely lacking during the pogroms of 1881. For greater caution, it was now introduced. Then three asterisks for a new, new thing, but not a new subtitle. And again, says Solzhenitsyn, let us repeat. The limitations on the rights of the Jews never assumed a racial character in Russia. They applied neither to the Karaites, nor to the Jews of the mountains, nor to the Jews of Central Asia, who, scattered and merged with the local population, had always freely chosen their type of activity. The most diverse authors explain to us, each one more than the other, that the root causes of the restrictions suffered by Jews in Russia are of an economic nature. The Englishman J. Parks, the great defender of these restrictions, nevertheless expresses this reservation. Quote, Before the war of 1914-18, to 18, some Jews had concentrated considerable wealth in their hands. This had led to fear that abolishing these limitations would allow the Jews to become the masters of the country. Professor V. Leontovich, a perfectly consistent liberal, notes, quote, Until recently, we seem to be unaware that the restrictive measures imposed on Jews came much more from anti-capitalist tendencies than from racial discrimination. The concept of race was of no interest in Russia in those years. So that's why what led to the problem, though, of course, except for specialists in ethnology. It is the fear of the strengthening of the capitalist elements which could aggravate the exploitation of the peasants and of all the workers, which was decisive. So they're anti-Jew because they're anti-capitalist, they're saying. Many sources prove this. Let us not forget that the Russian peasantry had just undergone the shock of a sudden mutation from the transition of feudal relations to market relations. That is, when they're the liberation of the serfs in, what, 1860-something. So then it's like when they got rid of slavery in the South, and all of a sudden you have a new relation, even if you're doing the same thing. Now you're a sharecropper instead of a slave. A passage to which it was not at all prepared and which would throw it into an economic maelstrom, sometimes more pitiless than serfdom itself, exactly. V. Chulguin, C-H-O-U-L-G-U-I-N-E, writes in this regard as follows on page 230. The limitations of the rights of the Jews in Russia was underpinned by a humanistic thought. It was assumed that the Russian people, taken globally, or at least some of their social strata, was, in a way, immature, effeminate, that it allowed itself to be easily exploited, that for this reason it had to be protected by state measures against foreign elements stronger than itself. The Jews are going to dominate these weak, effeminate Russian peasants, so we have to guard against that with laws and restrictions. Northern Russia began to look at the Jews with the eyes of southern Russia. The Little Russians had always seen the Jews, whom they knew well in the days of their coexistence with Poland, under the guise of the pawnbrokers who sucked the blood of the unfortunate Russian. The restrictions were designed by the government to combat the massive economic pressure that put the foundations of the state at risk. Parks also detects in this vision of things a part of truth. He observes, quote, The disastrous effect which the faculty of exploiting one's neighbor may have, unquote, and, quote, the excessive role of innkeepers and usurers in the rural areas of Eastern Europe. Even if he perceives the reasons for such a state of affairs, quote, in the peasants' nature more than in the Jews themselves. Cheaper for shearing, in other words. In his opinion, the vodka trade, as the, quote, main activity of the Jews in Eastern Europe, gave rise to hatred, and among the peasants even more than among the others. It was he who fed more than one pogrom, leaving a deep and broad scar in the consciousness of the Ukrainian and Belarusian peoples, as well as in the memory of the Jewish people. We read in many authors that the Jewish innkeepers lived very hard, without a penny, that they were almost reduced to begging. But was the alcohol market as narrow as that? Many people grew fat with the intemperance of the Russian people, and the landowners of Western Russia, and the distillers, and the drinking house keepers, and the government. 
the amount of revenue can be estimated from the time it was entered as national revenue. After the introduction of a state monopoly on spirits in Russia in 1896, with the abolition of all private debits and the sale of beverages by excise duty, the Treasury collected 285 million rubles in the following year to report to the 98 millions of the direct tax levied on the population. This confirms that not only was the manufacture of spirits a major source of indirect contributions, but also that the spirits industry's revenues, which until 1896 only paid, quote, four kopecks of excise duty per degree of alcohol produced, were much higher than the direct revenues of the empire. So the money is in the, in the booze in Russia. And when the Jews are forbidden, that really made them angry and increased their radicalization in the communism. But what was at that time the Jewish participation in this sector? In 1886, during the works of the Palin Commission, P-A-H-L-E-N, statistics were published on the subject. According to these figures, Jews held 27%. The decimals do not appear here. The numbers have been rounded up everywhere. Of all distilleries in Eastern Euro in European Russia, 27% of all distilleries in European Russia, 53% in the Pale of Settlement, notably 83% in the province of Podolsk, 76% in that of Grodno, 72% in that of Kherson. They held 41% of breweries in European Russia, 71% in the Pale of Settlement, 94% in the province of Minsk, 91% in the province of Vilnius, 85% in the province of Grodno. The proportion of manufacturing and sales points in Jewish commerce is 29% in European Russia, 61% in the Pale of Settlement, 95% in the province of Brodno, 93% in Mogilev, and 91% in the province of Minsk, that is, within, inside the Pale of Settlement. He uses a lot of parentheses. I changed my tone to reflect that. Using a sub or undertone. It is understandable that the reform which established the state monopoly on spirits was, quote, greeted with horror by the Jews of the Pale of Settlement. It says the government's taking over liquor and then kicking out the Jews, thus they're losing their money income. It is incontestable. The establishment of a state monopoly on spirits dealt a very severe blow to the economic activity of the Jews of Russia. And until the First World War, it ended at that time, this monopoly remained the favorite target of general indignation, whereas it merely instituted a rigorous control of the amount of alcohol produced in the country and its quality. Forgetting that it reached the Christian tenets in the same way, see the statistics above, it is always presented as an anti-Jewish measure. Quote, the introduction at the end of the 90s of the sale of alcohol by the state in the Pale of Settlement has deprived more than 100,000 Jews of their livelihood. Quote, power meant forcing the Jews to leave the rural areas, and since then, quote, this trade has lost for the Jews the importance it once had. It was indeed the moment from the end of the 19th century when Jewish emigration from Russia grew remarkably. So they start leaving after they're denied their alcohol control. Is there a link between this emigration and the establishment of the state monopoly on the sale of spirits? That is difficult to say, says Solzhenitsyn, but the figure of 100,000 quoted above suggests so. The fact is that Jewish emigration in America remained low until 1886-1887. It experienced a brief surge in 1891-1892, but it was only after 1897 that it became massive and continuous. The, quote, provisional regulations, unquote, of 1882 had not prevented further infiltration of Jewish spirits into the countryside. Just as in the 70s they had found a loophole against the prohibition of selling elsewhere than home by inventing, quote, street commerce. It had been devised to circumvent the law of May 3, 1882, which also forbade the commerce of vodka by contract issued with a Jew, leasing, quote, on the sly to set up an inn there or one rented a land by oral and not written contract in order for the taxes to be covered by the owner and the proceeds from the sale of drinks went to the Jew. It was through this and other means that the impl impl 
implantation of the Jews in the countryside could continue after the categorical prohibition of 1882. As Sleosberg writes, it was from 1889 that began the wave of expulsions of the Jews outside the villages of the Pale of Settlement, which resulted in, quote, a pitiless competition generating a terrible evil, denunciation. In other words, Jews began to denounce those among them who lived illegally. But here are the figures put forward by P. N. Milyukov. If in 1881 there were 580,000 Jews living in the villages, there were 711,000 Jews in 1897, which meant that the rate of new arrivals and births far outweighed those of evictions and deaths. In 1899, a new Committee for Jewish Affairs, the 11th of the name, in 1899, 11th Committee for Jewish Affairs, with Baron Lexhull von Hildenbrandt at its head, Lex Hull von Hindenbrand, L-E-X-H-U-L-L, was set up to revise the provisional regulations as we move on to 232. The committee wrote Milyukov, this committee wrote Milyukov, rejected the proposal to expel from the countryside the Jews who illegally established themselves there and softened the law of 1882. While, quote, recognizing that the peasantry, which is not very developed, has no entrepreneurial spirit and no means of development, must be protected from any contact with Jews, the committee insisted that, quote, the landowners have no need for the tutelage of the government. The limitations of the rights of owners to manage their property as they see fit depreciate said property and compels the proprietors to employ, in concert with the Jews, all sorts of expedients to circumvent the law. The lifting of prohibitions on Jews will enable landowners to derive greater benefit from their assets. But the proprietors no longer have the prestige which might have given weight to this argument in the eyes of the administration. It was in 1903-1904 that the revision of the regulations of 1882 was seriously undertaken. Reports came from the provinces, notably from Sviatopolk Mirsky, who was governor general and soon to become the liberal minister of the interior, saying that the regulations had not proved their worth, that it was imperative that the Jews should leave towns and villages where their concentration was too high, and that, thanks to the establishment of a state monopoly on beverages, the threat of Jewish exploitation of the rural population was removed. These proposals were approved by Sipyagin, the minister, who was soon to be shot down by a terrorist, S-I-P-Y-A-G-I-N, and in 1908 endorsed by Pleva, soon assassinated in his turn, P-L-E-H-V-E, a list of 101 villages had been drawn up and published, to which 57 others would soon be added, in which the Jews acquired the right to settle and purchase real estate and to lease it. In the Jewish Encyclopedia, dating before the Revolution, we read the names of these localities, some of which, already quite important, were to spread rapidly. Yuzovka, Lozovaya, Lenatkievo, Krivoy Raj, Sinel Nikovo, Slavogorod, <coughs> Slavgorod, Kakovka, Zmerinka, Chepatovka, Zdolbuniv, Novya Senyari, among others. Outside this list and Jewish agricultural settlements, Jews did not get the right to acquire land. However, the regulations were soon ab abrogated for certain categories. Graduates of higher studies, pharmacists, artisans, and former retired soldiers, they're, they're not subject to the law. These people were given the right to reside in the countryside to engage in commerce and other various trades. While the sale of spirits and the various kinds of farming, including that of the land, were the main source of income for the Jews, there were others, including notably the ownership of land. Among the Jews, quote, the aspiration to possess the land was expressed by the acquisition of large areas capable of harboring several types of activities, rather than by the use of small parcels which are to be developed by the owner himself. When the land, which gives life to the peasant, reaches a higher price than that of a purely agricultural property, it was not uncommon for a Jewish entrepreneur to acquire it. As we have seen, the direct leasing and purchasing of the land by the Jews was not prohibited until 1881, 
and the purchasers were not deprived of their rights by the new prohibitions. This is how, for example, Trotsky's father, David Bronstein, possessed in the province of Kherson, not far from Elizabethgrad, and held in his possession until the revolution an important business, and, quote, economy, unquote, as it was called in the South. He also owned, later on, the Nadijda, Nadijda mine in the suburb of Krivoy Raj. On the basis of what he had observed in the exploitation of his father, and, as he heard it, quote, in all farms it is the same, Trotsky relates that the seasonal workers who had come by foot from the central provinces to be hired were very malnourished, never meat nor bacon, oil but very little, vegetables and oatmeal, that's all, and this during the hard summer work from dawn to twilight, and even, quote, one summer, an epidemic of hemorrhalopia, I don't even know what that is, was declared among the workers. For my part, I will argue that in an, quote, economy of the same type, in Kuban, K-U-B-A-N, with my grandfather Sherbach, S-C-H-E-R-B-A-K, himself a member of a family of agricultural workers, the day workers were served during the harvest meat three times a day. I'm not sure if his point is that Trotsky was lying or that his, his direct personal knowledge of that was quite the opposite. But a new prohibition fell in 1903, quote, a, pro a provision of the Council of Ministers deprived all Jews of the right to acquire immovable property through the empire outside urban areas, that is to say in rural areas. This limited to a certain extent the industrial activity of the Jews, but as the Jewish Encyclopedia points out, by no means their agricultural activity. In any case, quote, to use the right to acquire land, the Jews would undoubtedly have delegated fewer cultivators than landlords and tenants. It seems doubtful whether a population as urban as the Jewish population was able to supply a large number of farmers. In the early years of the 20th century, the picture was as follows, quote, about two million hectares, which are now owned or leased by Jews in the empire and the kingdom of Poland, only 113,000 are home to Jewish agricultural settlements. So, you know, 5%. <coughs> <coughs> Although the provisional regulations of 1882 prohibited the Jews from buying or leasing out of towns and villages, devious means were also found there, notably for the acquisition of land intended for the sugar industry. And we heard earlier that Jews dominated the sugar industry. Thus, the Jews who possessed large areas of land were opposed to the agrarian reform of Stolypin, which granted the land to the peasants on a personal basis. They were not the only ones. One is astonished at the hostility which with which this reform was received by the press of those years, press in italics, and not only by that of the extreme right, but by the perfectly liberal press, not to mention the revolutionary press. As we go down to 234, the Jewish Encyclopedia argues, quote, The agrarian reforms that planned to seed land exclusively to those who cultivated it would have harmed the interests of a part of the Jewish population, that which worked in the large farms of Jewish owners. It was not until the revolution passed that a Jewish author took a look back and, already boiling with proletarian indignation, wrote, quote, The Jewish landowners possessed under the Tsarist regime more than two million hectares of land, mainly around Ukrainian sugar factories, as well as large estates in Crimea and Belarus, and moreover, quote, They own more than two million hectares of the best land, Black Earth, Supposedly, Ukraine has some of the best topsoil in the world, like nine feet deep or something. I may be wrong about it. I very well may be wrong about that, but not in this. But not that Ukraine soil is great, it is. Thus, Baron Ginsburg possessed in the district of Jankoy 87,000 hectares. The industrialist Brodsky owned tens of thousands of hectares for his sugar mills, and others owned similar estates, so that in total the Jewish capitalists combined 872,000 hectares of arable land. After the land ownership came the trade of wheat and cereal products. Let us remember that the export of grain, quote, was chiefly carried out by Jews. Quote, of the total Jewish population of the USSR, not less than 18% before the revolution, i.e. more than 1 million people, were engaged in the trade of wheat, 
bosses and members of their families alike, which caused a real animosity of the peasants towards the Jewish population. Because the big buyers did everything to lower the price of the wheat in order to resell it for more profit. So they're squeezing the goyim who produce it so they can make a higher profit. In the western provinces and in Ukraine, the Jews bought in bulk other agricultural commodities. Moreover, how can we not point out that in places like Klintsi, Zlinka, Starodub, Lelinovka, Novozibika, the old believers, workers and industrious, never let trade go by other hands. Beekerman believes that the prohibition of Jewish merchants to operate throughout the territory of Russia fostered apathy, immobility, domination by the kulaks. However, quote, if Russia's trade in wheat has become an integral part of world trade, Russia owes it to the Jews. As we have already seen, quote, as early as 1878, 60 percent of wheat exports from the port of Odessa were by Jews. They were the first to develop the wheat trade at Nikolaev, Kherson, Rostov-on-Don, as well as in the provinces of Oral, Kursk, and Chernigov. They were, quote, well represented in the wheat trade in St. Petersburg. And in the northwest region, out of a thousand traders of cereal products, there were 930 Jews. However, most of our sources do not shed light on how these Jewish merchants behaved with their trading partners. In fact, they were very often hard and practiced procedures that today we would consider illicit. They could, for example, agree among themselves and refuse to buy the crop in order to bring down prices. It is understandable that in the 90s, farmers' cooperatives under the leadership of Count Haydn and Bektiev were set up in the southern provinces for the first time in Russia and a step ahead of Europe. Their mission was to thwart these massive monopolistic purchases of peasant wheat. Let us recall another form of commerce in the hands of the Jews. The, quote, export of wood came second after wheat. So sugar, wheat, and timber are big Jew industries. From 1813 to 1913, these exports were multiplied by 140, so a huge growing area of the economy. And the communist Larinus fulminated, quote, the Jewish proprietors possessed large forested areas and they leased a part of it, even in the provinces where the Jews were not normally allowed to reside. The Jewish Encyclopedia confirms it. Quote, the Jews acquired the land, especially in the central provinces, chiefly to exploit the forest wealth. However, as they did not have the right to install sawmills in some places, the wood left abroad in the raw state for a dead loss for the country. There existed other prohibitions, access for export of timber in the ports of Riga, Revel, Petersburg, the installation of warehouses along the railways. Such is the picture. Everything is there. And the tireless dynamism of Jewish commerce, which drives entire states, and the prohibitions of a timorous, sclerotic bureaucracy that only hinders progress, and the ever-increasing irritation these prohibitions provoke among the Jews, and the sale of the Russian forest, exported abroad in its raw state as a raw material, and the small farmer, the small operator who, caught in a merciless vice, has neither the relationships nor the skills to invent other forms of trade. And let us not forget the Ministry of Finance, which pours its subsidies on industry and railways and abandons agriculture, whereas the tax burden is carried by the class of farmers, not the merchants. One wonders, under the conditions of the new economic dynamics that came to replenish the treasury and was largely due to the Jews, was there anyone to worry about the harm done to the common people, the shock suffered by it from the break in its way of life, its very being? For half a century, Russia has been accused, from the inside as well as from the outside, of having enslaved the Jews economically and having forced them to misery. It was necessary that the years passed that this abominable Russia disappear from the surface of the earth it will be necessary to cross the revolutionary turmoil for a Jewish author of the 30s to look at the past over the bloody wall of the revolution and acknowledge, quote, The Tsarist government has not pursued a policy of total eviction of Jews from economic life, apart from the well-known limitations in the countryside on the whole 
the Tsarist government tolerated the economic activity of the Jews. The tensions of the national struggle, quote, the Jews did not feel them in their economic activity. The dominant nation did not want to take the side of a particular ethnic group. It was only trying to play the role of an arbiter or mediator. So again, Jews lie, lying about Jews being persecuted from inside and outside Russia, when in fact they were restricted here and there, but overall they were not really infringed badly on. Besides, it happened that the government was intruding into the economy on national grounds. It then took measures which, more often than not, were doomed to failure. Thus, quote, in 1890, a bulletin was diffused under which the Jews lost the right to be directors of corporations that intended to purchase or lease lands. But it was the childhood art of this but it was the childhood of the art of circumventing this law, remaining anonymous. This kind of prohibition in no way impeded the activity of Jewish entrepreneurs. The role of Jews was especially important in foreign trade where their hegemony was assured in their geographical location near borders and by their contacts abroad and by their commercial intermediaries skills. As regards to the sugar industry, more than a third of the factories were Jewish at the end of the century. We have seen in previous chapters how the industry had developed under the leadership of Israel Brodsky and his sons Lazar and Leon. Quote, At the beginning of the 20th century, they controlled directly or indirectly 17 sugar mills. Galperine Moses, quote, in the early 20th century, had eight factories and three refineries. He also owned 50,000 hectares of sugar beet cropland. Quote, hundreds of thousands of Jewish families lived off the sugar industry, acting as intermediaries, sellers, and so on. When competition appeared, as the price of sugar began to fall, a syndicate of sugar producers in Kiev called for a control of production and sale in order for prices not to fall. The Brodsky brothers were the founders of the Refiners Union in 1903. In addition to the grain trade, the wood trade, and the sugar industry, where they occupied a predominant position, other areas must be cited in which the Jews largely contributed to development. Flour milling, fur trade, spinning mills, confection, the tobacco industry, the brewery. In 1835, they were also present at the major fairs in Nizhny Novgorod. In Transbaikalia, they launched a livestock trade which took off in the 90s, and the same happened in Siberia for the production of coal. On Jerno Suji, hard coal, and the extraction of gold, where they played a major role. After 1892, the Ginsberg, quote, devoted themselves almost exclusively to the extraction of gold. The most prosperous enterprise was the Lena Gold Mining Company, which was controlled, in fact, from 1896 until its death in 1909 by Baron Horace Ginsberg, son of Evzel Ginsburg, founder of the bank of the same name and president of its branch in St. Petersburg. The son of Horace, David, also a baron, remained at the head of the Jewish community of St. Petersburg until his death in 1910. His sons, Alexander and Alfred, sat on the board of Lena, the gold mining company. Another son, Vladimir, married the daughter of the owner of the Kiev sugar factory, Eli Brodsky. Horace Ginsburg was also, quote, the founder of the gold extraction companies from Transbaikalia, Mias, Beretsovka, Alte, and a few others. In 1912, a huge scandal about the Lena Mines, L-E-N-A, broke out and caused it quite a stir throughout the country. The operating conditions were abominable. The workers had been misled. Appropriately, the Tsarist government was accused of everything and demonized. No one in the raging liberal press mentioned the main shareholders, notably the Ginsburg sons. This is what angers me so much. So just like back then, they never, ever, ever, we're still allowing, no one ever mentions that it's a Jew responsible for any of this. Even a hundred, so whatever we're doing, it's not working. We're doing it completely wrong. You see what I'm saying? Moving on to 237. At the beginning of the 20th century, Jews represented 35% of the merchant class in Russia. Shulguin gives us what he observed in the southwest region. Quote, Where have they gone, Russian traders? Where is the Russian third estate? In time, we had a strong Russian bourgeoisie. Where have they gone? They were ousted by the Jews, lowered into the social ladder to the state of mujiks, peasants. 
The Russians in the southwest region have chosen their own fate, it is clear. And at the beginning of the century, the eminent politician V.I. Gurko observed, quote, the place of the Russian merchant is more and more frequently taken by a Jew. The Jews also gained influence and authority in the booming sector of the cooperative system. More than half of the mutual credit and savings and loan companies were in the pale of settlement. 86% of their members in 1911 were Jewish. We have already spoken of the construction and operation of the Russian railways by the Polyakov brothers, Bliok and Varshavsky, Polyakovs, with the exception of the very first lines, the Zaro Koselskaya line and the Nikolaevskaya line, almost all the railways that were later built were made by concessionary companies in which the Jews occupied command posts. Quote, but as of the 1890s, the state was the first builder. On the other hand, it is under the leadership of David Margolin that it was created in 1883, the great shipping company, quote, on the Dnieper and its tributaries, the main shareholders of which were Jews. In 1911, the company owned a fleet of 78 vessels and accounted for 71% of the traffic on the Dnieper. Other companies operating on the western Dvina, the Neiman, joined the Marinsky Canal and the Volga. There were also about 10 oil companies belonging to Jews from Baku. The biggest were the oil company belonging to the brothers S. and M. Poliak and to Rothschild, and the joint stock companies of the Caspian Black Sea, behind which was also the, found the name of Rothschild. These companies were not allowed to extract oil. They specialized in refining and exporting. But it was in finance that the economic activity of the Jews was the most brilliant. Quote, credit is an area where Jews have long felt at home. They have created new ways and have perfected the old. They played a leading role in the hands of a few large capitalists and in the organization of commercial investment banks. The Jews brought out of their ranks not only the banking aristocracy, but also the mass of employees. The Bank of Evzel Ginsburg, founded in 1859 in St. Petersburg, grew and strengthened thanks to its links with the Mendelssohn in Berlin, the Warburg in Hamburg, the Rothschild in Paris, and Vienna. But when the financial crisis of 1892 broke out, and, quote, because of the government's refusal to support its bank with loans, as it happened twice before, E. Ginsburg withdrew from business. By the 70s, there existed a network of banks founded by the three Polyakov brothers, Jacob, Samuel, and Lazar. These are the Azov-Don Commercial Bank, to be later managed by B. Kaminka, the Mortgage Lending of Moscow, the Don Land Bank, the Polyakov Bank, the International Bank, quote, and a few other houses which will later form the Unified Bank. The Bank of Siberia had A. Solovaychik at its head. The Commercial Bank of Warsaw was directed by I. Bliok. In several other large establishments, Jews occupied important posts. Zach Utin, Kaysin, A. Dobry, Vavelberg, Landau, Epstein, Krongold. Quote, in two large banks, the Commercial Bank of Moscow and that of the Volga, Kama, there were no Jews either in the leadership or among the, st the staff. That's the Commercial Bank of Moscow and that of the Volga, Kama, hyphen it. The Polyakov brothers all had the rank of secret counselor, and as we have said, all three were granted hereditary nobility. That'll do it for today. This is recording 13 of, of Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, Russians and Jews, their history. And this was basically a rundown of, of Jewish involvement in industry. And they talk about restrictions, but also more talk about how much they dominated certain things, no matter what the laws said. Look at the reality. Anyway, thanks for being with me today, and I'll be back with you again soon for more from Solzhenitsyn.